Amen. We have a great Mother's Day for you. We have a great speaker. She is the mother of my three children. She's also my wife of 15 years. Uh, What I love about Molly, among all the things, is the impact that God has done through Molly's life. If you've ever sat down with coffee for Molly, she invests deeply in people. She loves people, and she will challenge you to be a disciple that makes a disciple. And so for this Mother's Day, we are so excited that Molly is bringing the message. So if you will help me welcome to the stage, my wife, Molly Soderstrom. Hey, happy Mother's Day. You know, I've always thought it's so interesting because Mother's Day and Father's Day are so close together, yet they're often celebrated so differently. Uh, Mother's Day, you know, everyone kind of comes together with their family, children, goes out to brunch. I remember my first Mother's Day in Colorado nine years ago. I previously lived in Colorado for a short amount of time, but I was moving back with my husband and my kids. And it was a beautiful weekend. Like we were wearing shorts. It was 80 degrees outside. So we made these amazing plans to go hiking to celebrate Mother's Day on Sunday. And I just remember waking up Sunday morning, looking outside and seeing snow covered grounds. In fact, it was a blizzard. I looked over to Jason and said, what do we just do. Like I started second guessing the decision we just made. And then, you know, a couple, couple of weeks go by and here we have Father's Day. And by the time Father's Day, Father's Day rolls around, Colorado's in its prime, like beautiful summer. And by that time, all the husbands are leaving their children behind to go fishing and golfing without them. That's just how it works. But I do have to confess, the last two years, my gift for Mother's Day has been an overnight in a hotel room by myself because I love having a family, but it's tough being a mom. I'm a mom of three kids. I have Eden, Selah, and Judah, and they're an amazing, they're, uh, they're amazing children. But today I wanna to talk to two groups of people in this room. I wanna to speak to those of you in this room that are physical moms, that you have children at home that you're currently raising. And then I also wanna to speak to those in this room that are spiritual moms. And what I mean by that is a spiritual mom is someone who is helping another person that is not quite as far along in their faith to just take the next step. Some of you in here may fall into both of these categories. I just want to share with you some truths today that have helped me along the way raise physical and spiritual children. As I kind of look around this room, I would say it's safe to stay. say we all desire to be people of positive impact. And so we're actually all called to be spiritual parents. And being a parent can be tough. I mean, I feel like being a mom can be difficult. You know, keeping up with my kids' schedules and their friendships and relationships. Right now, I'm actually on a group text for my 12-year-old called the Lunch Brunch Crew. And if my daughter's not around to respond, I have to figure out how to respond like a 12-year-old girl. It can be complicated. But our, our world is actually trending towards not wanting to have children as much nowadays. And there's kind of several reasons why um, children, children, people aren't having children as much as they used to. There's, the first one is just some changing cultural attitudes around kids. Children, let's be honest, they can be inconvenient. You might not be able to pursue your hobbies to the extent that you used to. Also, having children just isn't seen as a necessary or even expected part of adulthood anymore. Also, when we, we see this when it comes to careers. Um, career aspirations can kind of take over, and especially with women, we put a lot of time and energy and work into our careers that it can be hard to think, you know, can we go back to our job at the same level as we did before? Not to mention the economic pressures. We see this when we go to the grocery store. Um, people may fear they might not be able to give the children the life that they want financially. I read an article the other day that said this, fertility rates have rapidly declined over the last 20 years, and we are not even hitting the 2.1 births for population replacement. So it's becoming clear that our, our world does not want physical children. And I truly believe that at the root of it is self-centeredness. Um, similarly, when it comes to following in Jesus, we're not wanting spiritual children as much because it takes sacrifice. But as we look at Jesus and we look at his perspective on this, it's completely opposite. Hebrews 12, two says this, and speaking of Jesus, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, Jesus did not opt into self-centeredness. Jesus knew the secret to life. 
that the sacrifice may be great, but the joy is even greater. So why do we see people having kids? I mean, at the first service, we saw all these amazing, cute little squishy children come up on stage. Children are just adorable, right? And then as you get to see them grow, there's just this amazing bond that happens between a parent and a child. Children do cause you to slow down, that is true. But in the world that we live in, I actually think that's a really good thing. Um, Also, you know, children just cause you to not take yourself too seriously. The other day, I was rushing from work to go pick up my children from school because I thought I had more time than I did. Sure, I'm the only one in here like that. And I got my children and my daughter, Eden, looked at me and saw my yellow nails. And she looked at me and she said, Mom, I thought you were going to get pink. And then she got this really serious look on her face. Eden is my most expressive child. She says, Mom, monkeys like bananas. They're going to see your nails and eat you. (laughs) But don't worry. All the monkeys are locked up in the zoo. So when you walk past, they're just going to look at you. And I just died laughing. Like, I could not contain it. All the anxiety that I have felt melted away. Eden, her love and protection for me was amazing. Eden is pure joy. The sacrifice as a mom is great. But the joy is even greater. As we look at scripture, we see there are so many biblical reasons to have children. In the very beginning, in Genesis, um, God's command to multiply and fill the earth. In Genesis 1.28, he says, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This command applies to all humanity and is seen as God's way to fulfill his plan for his creation. Also, we see that children are a blessing from God. Psalm 127 says this, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, A reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. And lastly, we see children provide a legacy and continuation of one's family. Proverbs states this, Grandchildren are the crown of the age, and the glory of children is their fathers. Having children provides a legacy and a heritage to be passed on down through one's family. But as I look at this room today, it's not possible for every person in here to be a physical parent. Some of you may be in middle school. Some of you may be a single young professional. Some of you may be past childbearing years or haven't been able to have kids quite yet. Or the other half of you in here are men. Let's be honest. And that's not in the cards for you. But God has given us all a way to be a spiritual parent. I look at my life. I was a spiritual mom long before I had physical children. Jesus, he never had physical kids, yet he had spiritual children. One of my greatest privileges in leading the Brook is that I get to be a spiritual mom to people. Um, I'm the executive director of the Brook. The Brook is a young professionals disciple-making movement that uses, uses a means of digital outreach, like online platforms like apps and Instagram, and then in-person events to really raise up faith leaders to have an impact in Denver and the world. And that's what God has allowed us to do over the last couple of years. I am so thankful for Restoration. They were the first church in Denver to kind of get behind us and let us utilize their building to help get going. And now we're our own nonprofit. We raise our own funds. And over the last three years, we've got to see over 6,300 people engage with the Brook through our online platforms. 2,800 people come to in-person events and get connected to an individual, people who may never walk into a church building. And lastly, we've seen 500 people get connected to our simple churches like Jason was talking about earlier. But to kind of share what this has looked like, I just want to share a story real quick of my friend Kira. So I met Kira a couple years ago. She was your typical young professional, had uh, graduated from college. She was working from home, um, working a tech job, and kind of feeling isolated, lonely, looking for purpose. And she stumbled across the, the brook online and just saw a community of people and connections, kind of what she was looking for. She saw there was a happy hour coming up, so she thought, why not? Let's give it a try. So she grabbed a friend, fast forward a couple weeks, and she walks into this happy hour with like 150 other young professionals hanging out who kind of look like her. And so she starts making some connections and friendships that evening, and I get Kira's number that night. Soon after that, Kira and I got to go out for coffee, and I just got to kind of share my story with her, what it's looked like for me to follow Jesus. 
And it soon became evident that Kira was leaning in towards the things of God, but she had never quite made a decision to make Jesus Lord of her life. Until that day, everything changed. Kira said yes to Jesus, and we started hanging out. I started sharing with her just what it looked like to talk to God and to pray and just to read the Bible and share her story in everyday conversations. And soon after that, Kira got baptized. Uh, She joined one of our connections teams at the Brook where people who come in online, we connect them with a real person to build a relationship. And she got connected to a girl named Madison. Madison had just moved to Denver a couple, I think about a week ago previously. And um, she got to build a relationship with Madison. They became friends. And Kira just started sharing with Madison, you know, some things that she was learning in her life. And they soon got to start a simple church of women. And it was going really well. And pretty soon, Madison just got this vision like, man, this is really changing my life. I want to help other women experience the same thing. So then Madison helped launch another simple church. And that church was going, and she found a leader named Jules to kind of take over that simple church. And that simple church was going. And then there was a girl in there named Addie who's in here today. And she said, you know what? I I want other women to experience what I'm experiencing. So she helped that group get going. And I just found out yesterday that there's two girls named Taylor and Valerie that are now leading that group. And so as we look back over the, the you know, couple, nine months, we see six generations of disciples raised up, ordinary single women giving their time. Um, and Kira, actually, she's living in my basement right now, so I get to see her schedule. And I will tell you this, Kira is learning something, that the sacrifice is great, but the joy is even greater. I've seen her be gone at night. So I've seen her give up her time to invest in other women and to see generational growth happen. So today I'm excited to dive into this passage with you and kind of share with you how we can all have a chance at becoming spiritual parents. So the passage we're going to look at today is Sir John. This isn't a book that we look at a whole lot in church, but I'm super excited about it. Um, This book is written by the Apostle John. He's the author, and he is referred to as the elder, which means that he's the leader of this church. At this point, the Apostle John, he's well advanced in age. He's actually the only apostle that is still alive that was with Jesus, which is pretty cool. Um, And what sets this, this book apart is that it's a personalized letter from John to his friend Gaius, who he calls his child in the faith. So as we look at the the New Testament, most, most of the books are written to an entire church, but this letter is special. It is personal. So in 3 John, it says this, The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Gaius was a common name back in the day, so we don't know exactly who Gaius was, except that John loved him because he was a fellow believer, but not only that, he was his child in the faith. He was faithful to the truth. John cared for Gaius. He actually says he wished him good health. This doesn't mean that he was sick. It's a common greeting back in those days. But what I love here is it says, he heard that you're getting along well in your soul, meaning Gaius was continuing to grow and walk in the ways of Jesus and become more like him. But you know what? I don't think it was a surprise to John when he heard this good report because it says he continues to walk in the truth. I think about my kids. I see how they're growing in the ways of Jesus. Um, my daughter, Sayla, for example, she loves serving. Like she, she has a heart to serve. And when I hear from the childcare upstairs or from the youth group that, you know what? There was a spot today and Sayla filled a need in the childcare. And then she was doing the slides. And Sayla's amazing. She has such a servant's heart. When I hear that from somebody else, I already know that about Sayla. But hearing it from somebody else, my heart just swells up inside. And I'm such a proud mom. That's how I feel like John was when he heard this report about Gaius. Gaius was not John's physical child, that is clear. But John describes Gaius as if he was his own. So today I want to share with you guys three truths that you guys can embrace in becoming a spiritual parent. I want to share with you some things that I've learned along the way in being a physical parent and in raising spiritual kids, some truths that I've learned. 
But as John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So the first truth that we have to embrace today to become spiritual parents is this. We have to know the truth. It starts with us, right? We have to know the truth. Just think if you're getting ready to deliver a baby, let's say you're pregnant, you know, it's helpful if you know like where to go to have the child. It's also good to know that you can't leave the hospital without a car seat in your car. And that when you get home, it would be really beneficial for you to have some diapers around the house, right? Um, so just like there's a couple of good things that it's good to know to be a, a physical parent, there's also some things it's important to know to be a spiritual parent as well. You need to know the truth. So how do we find God's truth? It's through his word. It is through his word. John 17, 17 says this, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Psalms 119 says, all your words are true. The cool thing is the apostle John knew this because he actually got to be with Jesus. He knew the truth because he was with Jesus. But we live in a world nowadays where truth is so relative, right? It seems like there's so many unknowns. But the scripture says, God's word is our standard of truth. With my physical children, when I am correcting them or training them or disciplining them, I'm trying to use God's truth. So I'll even a lot of times like get out my phone and point, get out the Bible app and share with them the verse I'm, I'm talking to them about or get out my actual Bible because I don't want them to think what I'm telling them is just something I made up. My words won't last, God's words will. Second Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word is amazing, but to use it, we have to know it first, right? Um, I'm kind of running into this thing with my daughter Eden right now. She's my youngest and she's not just my little one any, anymore, which makes me kind of sad. She's wanting to be like the big kids. And so she's kind of getting a little bit of an attitude. She wants to be involved in everything. And if she doesn't get her way, she's been getting frustrated. And so I've been sharing with her James 1.9. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And we go over this verse all the time, just not in the heat of the moment, but we go through this verse when we're riding our bikes. I have Eden memorize this verse. If you ask it to her today, she'll tell it to you. And it's because we're sharing God's truth with her, the truth of scripture. In the same way, I do this with my spiritual children. I was having a cup of coffee the other day with, um, with a friend that I'm helping lead spiritually, and it just became clear that there's just some lies that she has been believing. So what we did is we made a list of the lies, and then we made a list of God's truth. And I told her, I was like, what I want you to do, to do this week is to memorize those truths. So when you're in the heat of the moment, you already have them at your fingertips. There's this saying I heard a long time ago, and you will hear me say it over and over again. God's word disciples. God's word disciples. It's not our words that will be carried on forever. It is God's word. So that's the truth that we want to pass to our, our spiritual and physical children. So, okay, here we are. We see that to be spiritual parents, we have to know the truth. But this can be so daunting, right? Like, where do I begin? What does this even look like? I love what Joshua 1 8 says about this. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do you hear that? It says we're to keep it on our lips. We're to think about it, to meditate on it day and night. We're to keep it in front of us. And then, only then, will we be prosperous and successful. You know, I think about our world, I think we have it backwards, right? We want, we want to be prosperous. We want to be successful. But are we willing to engage with God and to know his word? When it comes to the scriptures, the goal is just getting into the scriptures. Um, I think about my children. I have three different kids, and they have three different ways that they connect with God and his word. My daughter, Selah, for example, she's my oldest and she's super creative. And so when she wakes up in the morning, connecting with God looks like taking out her phone, looking at her verse of the day in her Bible app, draw, making like a really cool background and then texting it to me to share what she's learned. On the other hand, my son Judah, 
He is like, he's rigid. He'll eat the same thing every day, do the same thing every day. He would wear the same thing every day if I let him. Um, That's a struggle. But uh, so for Judah, when he gets up, he listens to his Bible. He gets up and he listens to it. He's almost through um, listening to the whole Bible. But that's just how he connects with God and his word. My daughter, Eden, she's six. She's learning to read. And so um, she'll go into her room, play some kids' worship music on her Alexa, get out her kids' Bible, read some of the words that she can, look at the pictures, and then she'll draw a picture of what she felt like God spoke to her through his word. The whole point is start where you're at. We, we, you might all connect with God differently, but just get in his word and keep it in front of you. Just like we read earlier, um, it says, keep this book of the law always on your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. And this is, this is a kicker. So that you may be careful to actually do everything written in it. To know the truth is not enough. Um, it's just a starting point. We see that Satan even knew God's word, that he responded in pride and rebellion rather than in submission to God. And if I'm to be honest with you guys today, my biggest fear as a parent Um, with my kids growing up in a Christian household is that they will know the truth, that they won't walk it out. So the first step to becoming a spiritual parent is to know the truth. The second step is to live the truth. We have to live the truth, right? James 1.22 says this, do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. This is a tough teaching because you know what that means? If we come in here today and we all just hear this message, and we walk out and do nothing about it, it says that we are being deceived, that we are being deceived. We are called to action. The apostle John, I think about him, um, after he ascended to be with the father, he continued to live out the truth that he saw in Jesus. And like the story I shared in the beginning, it can be easy to read all the books on how to be a parent, but when you're in the thick of it in the middle of the night, it can be hard to live it out. So I just want to give you guys a couple examples. Personally, what this has looked like for me, how I've been challenged to live out the truth recently. In our household, we have a saying that the truth is better than a lie. The truth is better than a lie. And I have been challenged recently to not lie or to even bend the truth, what can be very easy to do. Leviticus 19.11 says, do not lie, do not cheat, do not steal. It's very clear. And I was hanging out with my daughter, Sayla, the other day, getting ready for her dance performance. And, uh, you know, she's in hip hop, but there's a couple kind of different types of shoes you can wear. And she says to me, Mom, like, my shoes aren't working really well. And um, the truth is, I actually bought her a pair of shoes on Amazon that were cheaper and got her sooner. And, and so she says to me, are these, the, are these the ones that were on the link my teacher sent? And I say, yeah. And she says, really? And then I say, No. I'm sorry, I I meant the truth. They're not the same exact ones. Um, I didn't buy her a new pair, but I wanted to be truthful. I wanted to model what it looks like to live out the truth. Another truth truth I've been challenged by recently is to live sacrificially, live sacrificially. First Thessalonians says this, instead we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Um, One of my best friends, Kelsey, she is amazing at this. She sacrifices for her kids. Her kids are at the age where they are always getting sick and she has to miss out on events all the time. But the word that comes to my mind when I think of Kelsey is delight. It is her delight to sacrifice for her children. I'm learning from Kelsey how to live sacrificially. Lastly, another truth that I've been humbled with recently is um, how to be a humble parent. First Peter says this, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because this, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. As I've been tucking my kids in at night, every once in a while, I will ask them for feedback. Hey, what can I do better as a parent? And you know what? They're not afraid to tell me. (laughs) It's humbling. And you know what? 99% of the time, they are right. And I do the same thing with my physical children, asking them, how can I better support you? How can I better help you walk in the ways of Jesus? These are just some personal examples from my life. But whatever you are learning from God's word, live it out. Put it into practice. Challenge yourself to not be deceived, but to live out the truth. So we see as spiritual parents, we are to know the truth, 
not to stop there. Next, we're called to live the truth. And lastly, we are called to teach the truth. If I'm being honest with you guys, the last thing I ever wanted to be is a teacher. Just being straight up. Um, All my girlfriends growing up wanted to be teachers. It was a cool thing to do. But actually, school was hard for me. Like, I had to go to tutoring. It didn't just come natural and easy. But the more I committed to it, the more capable I became. And that may be you in here today. You may be hearing this message and think, how could I ever share the truth? How could I do what Molly's talking about? I'm not qualified. Where do I even start? Being a spiritual parent doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter where you're at in your spiritual life. It doesn't matter your phase of life. Remember, a spiritual parent is someone who helps another person that's not as far along in their faith just to take the next step. So we see in 3 John that John comments on Gaius' faithfulness to the truth and how he continues to walk it out. When we're born, we are not born coming out of the womb walking, right? Like we have to, we have to learn how. We, we spend months watching our parents walk until finally someday we might get up the courage to kind of start to try to walk, but then we you know, stumble and fall. And then with a lot of encouragement, we get back up, we try it again until we're kind of walking on our own. And just as we teach our physical children how to walk, we need to teach our physical and spiritual children how to follow the truth. My favorite passage um, on teaching the truth comes from Deuteronomy. It says these, it says this, fix these words of mine on your hearts and on your mind. That's knowing the truth, right? It goes on to say, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. That's as a reminder to live out the truth. And then listen to this. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're walking along the road, when you lie down and when you get up all the time. Everything you do is an opportunity to teach. Uh, We see this in the life of Jesus. He didn't teach in the classroom, right? He taught as he went through life on the go. It wasn't this overly formal thing. Everything we do can be a teaching opportunity. I love in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it's where Jesus kind of gives the great commission, his final words. He says to his disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And just stick with me for a minute. Can you get this picture? Here we have Jesus. He's about to ascend into heaven and John is there with him. And he says to John, you know, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then we go, we go on to see John pass this on to Gaius, his child in the faith, who continues to pass it on. Can you imagine the joy of the father to see these words of his passed on down to teach the truth? The sacrifice is great, but the joy is even greater. I just want to share with you guys a quick few things that I've learned in teaching my physical and spiritual children along the way. But I do have to be honest here. When you have kids at home in your household with you, it is the easiest, best time to teach them because they're with you all the time. Everything is a teaching opportunity. But as your kids get older or as you're a spiritual parent, it can be harder because we have to fight for that time to be together. So if you have kids at home, take advantage of that time. One way that I like to teach the kids the truth in our household is I have these different truth statements that I've spoken over our kids. I, I've prayed them over them. I've said them to them countless of times. We're on a bike ride or we're just hanging out. And I want them to know the truth. And you know what? Words that we say become the people we are. The words that we say to ourselves also become the people we are. So I don't just stop there and saying these words on my children. I have them repeat them back to me because I want them to start living out the truth of God's word personally in their life. So, um, so check this video out. It's a quick um, snapshot into my world. Beauty for ashes, strength for fear, gladness for mourning, peace for a spear. I'm a strong and courageous man of God, fights for his right, strong as muscles, strong as mind, strong as faith in God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they, are ever pra- for they are ever praising you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Wow, it gives me so much joy to see these truths that I've been speaking over my kids and having them say to, to kind of start living them out. And you know what? The same is true for my spiritual children. 
The other day I got a text from somebody in the brook that said, hey, can I come over and throw the football with Judah and hang out with your family? And he knows that when we hang out, we're also going to speak truth over his life. We're going to teach him in the ways of Jesus and what a joy it is for us. Another way I teach the truth is I have these sticky statements I say to my physical kids all the time that they're probably completely tired of hearing, and I hope that they're ingrained in their brains. One of them is obey right away. Um, Obedience leads to joy. Every day before we start the day, first we pray. One that I say to my daughter is, God made her, he loves her, he's always, always with her. All these things I say over my children all the time. Am I a drill sergeant? No. No. But do I brainwash my kids with the truth and create routines and rhythms for them so that as they get older in life, the truth is going to be the first thing that comes to their mind? Yes, I absolutely do. Because if we do not brainwash our kids with the truth, the world is going to brainwash them with its version of the truth, right? So we say these truths over and over again. As I've been crafting this message, I've actually realized there's some things I do with my physical children I need to start doing more with my spiritual children. So if that's one of you in here today, get ready for fun, sticky statements coming your way. Um, (laughs) As a spiritual parent, teaching the truth a lot of times just looks like sharing what God is teaching you. If you're always in the Word learning something, a lot of times it's just passing on the truth that God's teaching you or applying God's Word to a situation that that person is in. So as we look back, and as we want to become spiritual parents, the three truths that we need to embrace are we need to know the truth, we need to live the truth, and we need to uh, teach the truth. Maybe you're here today and your next step is just getting in God's word more. Like, what does it look like to keep his word in front of you? Maybe you're, you're being called to start really living it out. Like, when you leave here today, like, how are you going to challenge yourself to live it out? Or maybe you're just ready to pass it on. Like, you know what? Like, you need to pass on the things that God is teaching to you. When I think of this idea of passing on, I think of uh, my friend Susan Simpson. She attends church here at Restoration. And I directly remember the first time that I met Susan out for coffee. It was when the war in Ukraine had just started. And uh, she had some spiritual children in Russia that she was fearful for. She told me how she was praying over her spiritual children. They were up at night, interceding for them, getting groups of people together to pray. They were on the phone with them constantly. They were raising money for them. And what I saw in Susan that day was the heart of a mother, the love of a mother for her kids. But as I got to know Susan and got to know her backstory, I came to find out that That is not how her life started. Susan was in the business world in her mid-20s when she came to faith. She later ended up going over to Russia for work and missions work. And she took that time to kind of grow personally in her relationship with God. When she was 30 years old, she heard a quote that forever changed her life. And it's this, children sit at tables and wait to be served. Mothers, get up and serve the meals. Let me say that one more time. Children, sit at tables and wait to be served. Mothers, get up and serve the meals. And at that moment, Susan realized she was like those children, that she had been sitting at the table, waiting to be served, following God, but really for herself. And it was then and there that God called her up to serve the meals, to be a spiritual parent, to get up and start moving around a little bit, right? So what that looked like for for Susan is she started connecting with uh, women in Russia, young professionals, building relationships with them, having them over to her house. I recall her saying her ministry happened around a table over a pot of soup where she was sharing the truth of Jesus and how these other women could faithfully follow him as well. It was funny, she said there were so many women joining the ministry and guys, you know, where where, where there's women, guys start coming around. So they started praying for a guy to join the team. And the guy that joined ended up being her husband, Michael. Susan got married at age 39. And soon after, they kind of felt like maybe it was time for them to maybe give kids a try, try for kids. Um, But Susan and Michael had two miscarriages. Susan never got to be a physical mom. 
to this day. But she has spiritual kids that are having generational impact over and over again. And I remember something that Susan told me. She said this, Molly, children are a blessing from the Lord no matter how long they live outside the womb. Her and her husband went back to Russia to continue to do ministry there. And there's one story that stuck out to me of a lady named, Ma- named Masha. Masha was a, one of the ladies that Susan met as a young professional. She came to faith and she started growing in the things of Jesus. Now Masha is a mom and she is passing those spiritual truths onto her physical kids. And Susan said to me, you know, Molly, you know, my story is not traditional. It's just not. But you know what, Restoration Family? We don't serve a traditional God. We don't serve a cookie cutter God. We serve a God that delights in sacrifice. We serve a God that takes what we give Him and multiplies it. We serve a God that intersects generational lines and changes them forever. Amen? The key to Susan is that she knew the secret of Jesus, that for the joy set before Him endured the cross. Susan knew that the sacrifice is great, but all the joy is even greater. So what about you? Where are you at? Are you willing to lay down your life? And are you willing to get up and serve the meals? To be a spiritual parent, to pass on the little you may know to somebody else. Because as we come together today, to celebrate all the physical moms and the spiritual moms. We say the sacrifice is great, but we know the reward is greater. And it is my prayer for every person in this room that one day we will all be able to say, like the Apostle John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that your word is truth, that you have come to earth, that you have embodied love. We thank you for your love towards us, Jesus. But God, we thank you that you made us where we're at, Father. God, I pray for the truth that we've heard today, that that as these words that were spoken, Lord, that they would go forward, that they would produce fruit, Father, that every person here, you would speak to their hearts and that they would know, God, that every person in here, that no one is disqualified. There is nothing that anyone could do that anyone has ever done that would separate us from the love that is in Jesus Christ. And God, God, that we would stand up and that we would be those spiritual parents who pass on the truth and that, Lord, you would intersect generations. It is in your name we pray, amen.